for joining. Please stand and sing with us this morning. years ago and uh, we started attending CEFC pretty early on and we really liked the church um, but one thing that was kind of difficult for us was it was a little bigger than we were used to and we decided we should join a life group and that has been really wonderful it helps us feel a lot more connected to the church we've made friends we can talk about the Bible we can talk about our differences and find people that really um, want to journey with us to follow Christ 
So mine's a bit different. So I grew up in the area. I'm from Perry County, but I went to a different church. However, when I came back from grad school, I decided I needed something different. So I had a friend who went to CESC. She was like, hey, I'm in a life group. Why don't you come check it out? Because it's a good way to get connected in because it is a large church. And it just kind of went from there. Um, I think our group grew pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And that core group, I think when we started was um, really beneficial in making me feel like I wanted to stay at CESC. One of the things that has stayed consistent for us since March, since quarantining, is our life group. Um, we had to switch to Zoom meetings, of course, but it was really nice to still be able to look forward to that every week and to know that we had that core friend group that, like, kind of no matter what happened, we were able to count on them and count on meeting with them and being able to share our struggles and pray for each other. And the best part is, in my mind, is we don't always agree on things, but there's such a camaraderie of discussion and respect that we do the hard talks and we do the life talks and we do the real talks and I think at the end of the day that's what this group is about is meeting in a place to feel comfortable and to talk about Jesus and to just say hey you know what I'm not perfect. Over the past summer we've gotten to do socially distant campfires and those two campfires that we've had have just been so uplifting we just get together we eat some food we we have we've sang birthday songs but that's it there's no campfire singing no one strums a guitar but not we, yet. Did, not, <laughs> we haven't tried that yet yeah but we just do um, yeah we got to see each other we got to hang out eat some s'mores and just really enjoy each other's company because I think that was actually for me the first group of more than like three people that I saw and like it's still a small enough group that you could feel comfortable getting together with in this time and so that's been really key for me. In the middle of doing those campfires we were talking about what the future was for the life group and as a group we all collectively decided that we didn't want to see the life group dissolve and I think that's what really for me cinched um, the decision to say hey I'll step up and do this is the fact that everyone was really like no we do still want to be a group. The group was not only important to us but also to everyone in the group. Um, it had become part of our lives that we didn't want to let go um, so we wanted to lead together and make it a team effort and keep this community that we found going. Looking into like as we start this, Life Group has been such a pivotal moment and such pivotal um, times over the last year and a half for me and I am actually so excited for us to start this fall. I think it's going to be really interesting. I think we're going to do pretty well trying to keep low, low expectations. <laughs> Not to be too crazy, um, but I am really excited about this. I think it's going to be really um, just an opportunity for us to continue growing as fellow believers, fellow friends, and also I think this is a great opportunity that I hope all of you guys kind of take like we did. Yeah, we definitely want to encourage anyone looking to create deeper connections in the church, meaningful friendships, um, to definitely try a life group, try it out. Um, it's definitely been kind of a life changer for us and we can't imagine our lives without it now. Hi, I'm Michelle. Hi, I'm Katie. Life My groups are in full swing this fall here at CEFC. As we said in the video, if you're looking for a Christian community, this is a great way to get connected. Our life group has given us a group of friends who encourage us in our faith, who pray for our struggles, and who give us a sense of belonging here at CEFC. There are many groups, no matter what stage of life you are in. You can find these on the CEFC website or on the app. Uh, you can also visit the Welcome Center to learn more about life groups or how to find them on the app. Um, also starting soon is our student ministry meeting here each week at CEFC. Starting on September 13th, which is today, I think, <laughs> student ministry is meeting outside with a bonfire, music, and a message here at Carlisle campus. Uh, we invite students to join at 6 p.m. for this time of encouragement with others. And also starting soon is KC Club, our Wednesday night program for children in kindergarten through fifth grade, which will begin October 7th. KC Club is designed to go deeper into the Bible lessons from Sunday mornings through small group discussions, fun activities, scripture memory, and more. Uh, times are 6.30 to 8 p.m. at CEFC Carlisle Campus. You can register on the CEFC website or on the app. So we want to say thank you for um, the safety precautions that you all are taking during this time. As you know, you have to do register for services and keep as much socially distanced as possible. This allows us to still continue to meet together and fellowship during this unprecedented time.
So we're going to go into an app, some time of giving. And giving looks a little different right now. We don't hand around baskets. But you can give online, or you can give in some of the select boxes. If you would like to give online, there are links um, that can be found on the app or on the website under the giving tab. If you will, let's open up in prayer. Father, you have come with us today to meet and to fellowship and to be your people, Father God, in this area. We pray for the people of Carlisle and the people of Mount Holly as they meet as well. Have us be your people and have us be your light here on earth as we go through this time. Please be with those who are out west during the devastating wildfires and those all around in our own communities that have struggles that we don't know about. Let this church be a light. Let it be your word and your voice here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
Well, today we're beginning a new series, and the series is called The Hard Work of Getting Along. The Hard Work of Getting Along, and that's because getting along is hard work. And you might be wondering, is that, is that an appropriate topic for this time? I mean, does anybody need help getting along? And the answer is, yeah, they do. A lot. A lot. And Jesus speaks to us, and he says, blessed are the peacemakers. I like that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And I was wondering, where are the peacemakers today? Where are the peacemakers? Well, the peacemakers ought to be the people who are following Jesus. But I think when we look around at at society in general, we see a great deal of conflict. And I know it's easy to point fingers outside. But if you look in your own home, you probably find conflict even there. And where is the peacemakers in the house? I think often even just siblings fighting with each other. I was thinking about my own childhood, and I have some brothers, and we fought. It was mostly their fault, almost entirely their fault. I remember one day I um, was told by my parents it was time to go to bed. I had to brush my teeth. I went to brush my teeth, and my younger brother, who was smaller than me and so felt like he couldn't fight physically, fought unfair, and what he did is he put um, Ajax cleaning powder in my toothbrush, which I could not see, but I could definitely taste when I started to brush my teeth, and then we fought. So not peacemakers. We weren't peacemakers. And I look around and I wonder, where are the peacemakers? If Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, where are the peacemakers? And we see that there's conflict all around us. Conflict at work, conflict, as I mentioned, in the home. And people have disagreements over complicated things like politics and over simple things like how to stack the dishwasher properly. Why can't people do that? I just, that's a... (laughs) point of conflict. And there's a conflict that's brewing, I know, in the schools. And, and if you're a student, you've had conflict with friends and with classmates. And if you're on a sports team, I was watching the NBA playoffs last night, and I noticed there was conflict between people on the same team, and then conflict between people on opposite teams, and then conflict with people in the stands. And this is just, I think it's, it's the state that we're in right now, isn't it? A state of agitation. And Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. What about in church? Oh, a church is perfectly peaceful, isn't it? No, I'm afraid especially sometimes in church there's conflict. And conflict sometimes with people you've never even met before on the interstate. I was driving to church yesterday. And as I was merging onto the interstate, this person, I don't believe I've ever met them before. They sped up to block me from getting onto the interstate. And if I hadn't been preparing for this message, I would not have known how to respond in a way that reflected Jesus. So we can all just say, thank you, Lord, for this message because it's timely. Uh, The Bible is timely, or maybe it's better, the Bible is timeless, that what the Bible has to say is for us today. It's helpful, and so I'm excited to talk with you about a passage of Scripture, several passages of Scripture which I need and which, if I'm honest, I look around and I think you might need it too. And so let's talk about Jesus, who said, blessed are the peacemakers. And, you know, the Bible gives instructions about peace all throughout the scriptures. And I'd like to bring out a few of those passages for us to think about. And then I want to give you some practical strategies to pursue peace. Because it's all well and good to say that we should be at peace. But the question is, how? How do we do it? And so I want to tell you some strategies from the Bible, three of them, on how to pursue peace. To pray, to be gentle. Well, and to give gifts. And I will talk about that in a moment. But first, let's look at these passages. I want to read Psalm 34, verse 14 first. And can I tell you that Psalm 34, 14 is also repeated in in 1 Peter, which means it's very important. And here's what it says. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Turn away from evil. That means you, you can't pursue peace and evil at the same time any more than you can walk north and south at the same time. They're in different directions. And so if you want peace, if you want to be blessed, you have to turn away from evil. And then you have to pursue, seek peace. Okay, the next passage is Hebrews 12, verse 14. And the author writes this, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That word strive, it it, it carries with it the idea of, of intense effort, that it requires effort to find peace, to pursue peace. It requires us to, to exert intentionality. And then lastly, and this is the verse I want to think about with you for, for a bit longer, we're coming to Romans 14, verse 19, and here the Apostle Paul writes, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. 
let's pursue. That, that's a, it's a word that, again, involves effort. Pursue peace. And if peace has to be pursued, that means that it's elusive. Uh, peace is something that has to be hunted, has to be tracked. And we are called to, to put intentional effort into pursuing and going after peace. That means peace doesn't come looking for you. Peace is not like a butterfly that if you sit still and do nothing, it will come and land on your lap. Peace is like a beautiful and wild animal that you have to chase and catch. If, if your strategy for peace is that you'll simply do nothing, then you won't get peace. You'll just get a pause in the fighting. And if at home you think, well, we've been, at, we've been in conflict. If at work you say, well, I'm fighting with somebody at work. We're, we're, not, we're not seeing eye to eye. And in fact, they seem to be intentionally trying to harm me. And you say, well, I'm just going to not engage. That will be my response. My response will be to not engage. Well, then you may have a pause in the fighting, but you won't have peace. Peace takes effort. It takes intentionality. And that's why Jesus says to pursue it. Peacemaking, you can see, is an active thing. Anything that, that is made takes some effort and some intentionality. And so here's the question for us. Are we willing, with God's help, with his strength, to do the work required to pursue peace? Well, I, I said at the beginning, how do you do it? And uh, let me give you three strategies. I'm not saying these are the only strategies, but these are biblical strategies. The first is to pray. The second is to give a gentle answer, and the third is to give a gift. Now, let's talk about prayer. Prayer is the first step to pursuing peace because peace needs to begin inside. It needs to begin in our hearts. And God is the one who gives peace. I'm talking about a true peace, not a false peace, not a peace that, that pretends that things are well when really they're not, but a peace that surpasses understanding, a peace that goes beyond circumstances and that's exactly what the Apostle Paul prays for. This is how he prays. I'm, I'm reading now from Romans 15, verse 13. First step in pursuing peace is prayer. He writes this. He prays this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now, if, if you hear that prayer, is there anybody who wouldn't want somebody to be praying that prayer for them? that God would fill them with hope and with peace. And that's exactly what God is able to do. In a time where people often feel hopeless, feel, feel anxious, God is able to fill us with hope and with peace. A peace, as the scripture says, that goes beyond understanding. In other words, a peace that is, that is beyond circumstances, a peace that's, that's internal. And what I love about God's peace is that you can have God's peace in your heart even when there's chaos all around you. Just like you can have warmth in your home, even when there's a cold storm that is, that is blowing and, and, and tearing things apart around you. And God is able to give a peace that, that calms your heart and your soul while everybody else is in raging chaos around you. Don't you need that? I need that. The first step to pursuing peace with others is to have peace from God, to have a peace that, that, that is in your heart. And what this looks like is, if you think about how most people are feeling and responding right now, I think we'd have to say that most people are filled with anxiety and a sense of angst. And we know this because they say it and, and also because of the way that they interact with each other. It just it comes bubbling out of them. It's like knives that come, come flashing out from the heart because in the heart is anxiety and angst. And so in our interactions with other people, it comes out. That's biblical. You know, the Bible says out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If we were going to make it modern, we'd say out of the overflow of the heart, the fingers post. You know, it just, it comes out of what's in your heart. And so don't be surprised by what you say. It was in your heart first. Nobody speaks with their mouth and, and they say, oh, my words got ahead of my mind. But never do our words get ahead of our heart. Never do our words get ahead of our heart. And so if we're going to pursue peace, it has to start with a heart. And that is the, the place where the Lord Jesus loves to work most in the heart. So we pray, may God fill me with hope and peace. Fill, and there's a reason to be filled because in my heart now is angst and anger and what I'm asking God to do is to fill my heart up to the place of overflowing so that that anxiety and that anger, that frustration is flushed out so that out of the overflow of my heart, I would speak words of peace and hope and joy. Can I ask you if the people around you 
the people that you're speaking with would say, out of the overflow of her heart, out of the overflow of his heart, he speaks peace and hope. Or would people say, out of the overflow of the heart, there is anger and frustration. There's short-temperedness and there's criticalness. What is the condition of our heart? I want to ask us to look at our heart. And then to receive from God a peace that comes from above. It's a divine peace. And that means it's wise. It's not some sort of a feeble peace that lays down and gets trampled on. It's a wise peace that knows, that knows how to respond. Because it's God who gives us instruction. It's God who, who, who gives us the words to speak. We're not speaking simply what we want. We're speaking what the Lord would have us to speak. And that means, oh, I want to ask a question. Do you wish that other people, not you, I'm talking about other people. Do you wish, do you ever wish that other people would spend more time praying and less time posting? Do you ever wish that? And I think the reason we're, we're, we're wishing for that is because we know that what's happening right now is people are, are speaking and typing out of an anger and an angst in their heart. And often Christians speaking and typing out of an anger and an angst in their heart, out of a frustration instead of out of the love of Jesus Christ, instead of out of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I believe if, if we prayed before we posted, if we prayed before we spoke, we'd experience a great deal more peace. I'm not saying we'd have peace with everyone, but I'm saying we would have more peace. And even if we had peace with no one, we would at least have peace with God. And not only peace, but blessing. Because the scripture says, blessed are the peacemakers. And so are we praying first that God would give us in our heart his peace, his divine peace, his supernatural peace, his peace which goes beyond all understanding. And do you know when God is at work in your heart, he changes your heart. And then your heart begins to desire and to value the things that are eternal, the kingdom of God. And then you begin to care about not your reputation, but Christ's reputation. And that means that before you speak or you post, you start to think, well, how is this going to reflect on Jesus? Is this going to advance the kingdom or is this going to create a barrier for the kingdom? And you begin to think, I would love to win people over to Jesus more than I would like to win my point. I would love to win people over to Jesus more than I would like to have people think well of me. And so you begin to see yourself as second. And that turns out to be the most blessed place. Oh, not even second, but third, because you put Jesus first and then others and yourself last. And the, the amazing mystery of life is the mystery which is revealed in Scripture, that when you put Jesus first and others second and yourself last, you receive the joy of the Lord in your heart. It begins to fill you. But when you put yourself first, your ideas first, your, your rights first, and you begin, you begin to insist, well, then you may get your way, but you will not get the peace of God and you will not receive the blessing of God. And the blessing of God makes you rich. And he doesn't add any sorrow with it. What I'm saying is that what God can give is greater than anything that you can grab. So we begin with prayer. Lord, change my heart. Lord, fill me with hope and peace. That's Paul's prayer for the people in Rome, the people in a place of political turmoil. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. In believing what? In believing the good news of Jesus. So first thing is to pray. Here comes the second thing. The next strategy for pursuing peace is a gentle answer. When the heart is gentle, when the heart has, ma has been made soft by the Lord, then it can speak gentle words. And so I, I would like to read to you a proverb. And this proverb is from chapter 15, verse 1. It says this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So a gentle answer, it turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, I love this, this passage because it's one I struggle with, and it's one that I need to remind myself of over and over again. And some years ago, as I was looking at this passage, even though I'm not a huge tennis fan, I, I thought of some of the great tennis players, uh, Roger Federer, for example, who is amazing at, at the drop shot in tennis. And the drop shot, you know, is, is, is a, it's a great strategy in tennis, and it's a great strategy in conflict. And if you've watched tennis, even just casually like me, you know that often the ball is hit back and forth and, and with aggression. It's like an argument. And it goes harder and harder, back and forth. And you can watch, just like you watch two people arguing. But somebody who's really good at tennis, they master a shot called the drop shot, which is really a very gentle shot. It's a soft response. 
And so when the other person hits back with great, with great aggression, the, the gifted, the wise, they respond not with aggression in return, but with something soft. They absorb. And the, the, the ball that hits the racket is absorbed, and it's given a backspin, and it just barely goes over the net, and, and the volley dies right there. When somebody responds to you in anger, in frustration, with agitation, our, our natural response, the fleshy response, our human response, is to return fire with fire. However people respond to us, we tend to respond in like fashion. Uh, the, the people who study these things will call it the law of reciprocity, that what somebody does to you, if somebody hits you, you're likely to hit them back. If somebody's angry at you, you're likely to be angry back. But the wise person, the person whose heart has been changed by Jesus Christ, the person who is looking for the kingdom of God and not building up their own kingdom, that person does not return anger with anger, but returns anger with gentleness. That when somebody comes at you with a sword, you respond with a pillow. And that seems like it won't work at all. But it does. In the brilliant wisdom of God, the person who responds gently is the person who is working towards peace, the person who is blessed by God, and the person who often finds themselves at peace with others. I was speaking some years ago with a retired gentleman who was explaining um, about a conflict that happened in his family. And the conflict was this, that one person accused another person of ruining his water heater. And he came to the person, he was yelling at them, he was angry, he was clearly upset. And so what is the natural response? The natural response is to say, I didn't do it, and, and then to start firing back. But instead, when this person came yelling, the person responded, well, if I broke it, I'll have to buy it. And he said it quietly and he said it gently. And the person who was angry just didn't know how to respond. They weren't expecting that. They're expecting defensiveness. They're expecting protest. But when they heard this response that was gentle, that was soft, they, they were stunned. And they just, they sort of walked away. And then do you know that they found out that, that person was not responsible for breaking the water heater. It was somebody else. And can you imagine what reputation Jesus gets when we respond with gentleness, when that person is willing to take the blame willing to take uh, uh, some responsibility. If, if it was me, I will pay for it. And, and can you imagine when they find out that that person wasn't responsible and they think back about that response, doesn't that, doesn't that have an effect on somebody? It does. It begins to make people think, I wonder, where did they get that kind of wisdom? Where did they get that kind of wisdom? This is the type of wisdom that comes from above. God wants to give us a wisdom that responds with gentleness, a gentle response, a soft answer instead of a hard answer. And our fleshly, our fleshly reaction is to go a different direction, which is why we have to pray first so that we can hear from Jesus. What I'm saying is this, before we start speaking to other people, let's speak with Jesus. Before we start posting, can we start praying? And I know this from experience with myself and with others that when we pray first, when we speak with God first, before we start speaking with other people, it changes not only our heart, it changes our response. We begin to speak with a gentleness, a softness, a compassion, with a hope and with a joy that comes from the Lord. Is that you? Is that me? Do people know us by our gentle and godly responses or do they know us as people that if you poke us in the wrong spot, we respond with venom and anger? So, first step is, is prayer. Second step is to give a gentle answer. Can I give you an example of that? In 1 Samuel 25, there's a woman named Abigail. She's married to a man who is a terrible man. He's, 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 he is sort of the epitome of the person who responds with anger and grumpiness and agitation. David, who is a warrior with 600 men, had been caring for and watching over Nabal, the husband's shepherds, and so David came and said, it's a feast day. Is there anything that you could spare that you could give us? And this man responded with great anger and disgust and was insulting. And so David went back to his men and he said, everybody put on your sword. We're going back and we're going to destroy his entire group of people. And as David and his armed men were advancing with, with murderous thoughts in their mind because they had been treated badly and they were going to respond with anger in return, Abigail, the wife, she comes out to David and she gets down off of her donkey and she speaks to him gently. And that gentle answer 
turned away wrath. That gentle answer calmed David, and then she gave a gift. She had food prepared for the men, and she offered the gift. And that brings me to the third strategy, which is to give a gift. Can you imagine giving a gift to your enemy? Can you imagine the person that you're in conflict with, the person at work, the person in your home that you're fighting with, that you give them a gift? And yet that's exactly what the scriptures say and exactly what Jesus says. I want to read from Romans 12. Romans 12 says this, if your enemy is hungry, good, let him be hungry. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And what that means is the person will be baffled. Their mind will, will, will explode. I, I, we are enemies. Why would you give me something to eat? We are enemies. Why would you give me something cold to drink? Is this really practical, though? Because if you think about it, how many of your enemies are hungry and thirsty? No, your enemies don't have those needs. What gift do we give to our enemies? What is it? What do we do? And sometimes it's obvious if, if you had an enemy who was hungry, of course, give them food. If, if they're thirsty, of course, give them a cold beverage. But what is it that your enemy needs? I think we have to ask the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom on that. What gift do I give to my enemy? You know, uh, sometimes um, I, it's necessary for me to give somebody a gift. It's their birthday, uh, there's some special event, and, and I'm required, uh, and I want to, I want to give them a gift, but I don't know what to give them. I, I, I just, I'm not, anybody else like that? You're just not a good gift giver. You don't know what would be a, an appropriate gift. And so do you know what I do? I ask my wife. She is a great gift giver. Every time, I've learned this, every time I go to my wife and I say, what should I give this person? And my wife will say, well, tell me about them. And she'll, you know, she'll kind of coach me along. And you'd think after a while I'd learn how to do this, but I don't. I just depend on her. I, I go to her and I say, what gift should I give? And she says, give this. And I give that gift. And, oh, that, that was the right thing. Can I tell you? You probably, unless you're really gifted, you probably don't know what gift to give your enemy. But if you asked the Holy Spirit, what gift should I give? You know, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is in you in your heart. He lives in you. And he will speak to you and he will say, here's what you do. Your enemy needs encouragement. Encourage. Your enemy needs compassion. Give compassion. Your enemy needs somebody to wash the dishes. Wash the dishes. Your enemy needs somebody to mow the lawn. Go mow the yard. What I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit knows what your enemy needs, even if you don't know. And so you ask the Holy Spirit, what do I give? What is it that you want me to give my enemy? And do you know, your heart has to be right with God in order to give a gift to your enemy. That's evidence that your heart has been changed by Jesus Christ. If your heart hasn't been changed, you don't want to give a gift. You, you can't give a gift. Even something as small as an ice cream cone, you wouldn't want to give. But if Christ is in your heart, then you say, I want to give something to this person that I've been in conflict with because I want to win them. I want to make peace. Can we be good gift givers? Gift givers who go to the Holy Spirit and say, what is it that I should give? Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus says this. He says, but I say to you who hear, are you hearing? Are you listening? Here's what Jesus, if you're listening, here's what Jesus says. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. What Jesus is saying is sometimes the best gift is prayer. Prayer for your enemy. You see, we started with prayer and here we've come full circle to pray for your enemy. What a great gift that is. It's a gift that moves in the heavens and so I want to ask, are you praying for your enemy? Are you praying for your enemy at work or at school? Are you praying for the enemy in your home? The person you've been fighting with, you've been in conflict with? And I don't mean praying, Lord, teach them a lesson. No. Lord, bless them. Lord, be at work in their heart. What I'm saying is, is, is to pray as Jesus would pray. And you know, Jesus did pray for his enemies. He prayed for you even before you turned to him. Jesus was praying for you. Jesus was speaking to the Father on your behalf. And this is, this is who Jesus is. He gives gifts. He's, he is a gracious God. He is the God of peace, the God who is a gift giver. And Jesus gives gifts to you before you deserve it, before you earn it. And do you know that that is exactly what we're to be doing? We're to be following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ who gives grace upon grace. That means he doesn't just give a one-time gift, but over and over. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you've experienced this. 
that Jesus continues to forgive you, continues to accept you, continues to speak gently to you, continues to encourage you. All those are gifts. Continues to watch over you, continues to draw you into himself. Even after you've pushed him away, he's still holding out his hand to you saying, come to me, come to me. That's a gift. And if Jesus, who is the God of peace, if he's still about the work of peace, if he's still the peacemaker, then shouldn't his people be peacemakers? Blessed are the peacemakers. I want to give you a, a realistic picture because that's what the Bible does. I, you know, I, I've gone through these three strategies of praying and giving a gentle answer and giving a gift, and, and perhaps you'll say, well, then I will do these things, and I will absolutely, then there will be peace, but there might not be. Even the scriptures say so. Paul, the apostle, who knew a lot about conflict, he wrote this. He said, if it is possible, it means it might not be possible. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Here's the realistic picture. Some people, you're going to try to pursue peace with them, and they don't want it. They won't take it. But as much as it depends on you, as much as it depends on you. And I think if we were going to give an honest assessment of the way that we're responding to other people, we'd have to say that we really haven't done all that we could do. We really haven't walked with Jesus in the way that we could in pursuing peace. But can I tell you that even as you pursue peace, there will be some people who won't have it and because they wouldn't have it with Jesus. Jesus was perfect, the only perfect person to ever live on this earth. And even Jesus was not at peace with all people. He prayed for them. He gave them gifts. He extended to them his grace, his forgiveness, his love, and they would have nothing to do with it. They wouldn't receive it. But can I tell you that today Jesus is still holding out gifts, still praying, still speaking gently and encouraging people, and he's saying to you and me, are you, are you with me or are you against me? That's a good question, isn't it? Are you with Jesus or are you against him? Are you with Jesus praying for those who are your enemies? Are you with Jesus speaking gently and encouragingly to people who are your enemies? Are you with Jesus giving the gifts that the Holy Spirit prompts you to give because you desire to win people over more than you desire to be thought of right, more than you desire to get your own way? You desire Jesus' way. And the only, the only thing that can change your heart to want Jesus' way is if Jesus is in your heart. If Jesus isn't in your heart, would you just take a moment, even right now, to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm at conflict not just with the world, but I'm at conflict with myself. And I want your peace. I want your forgiveness. And you know that if you pray that, if you believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he comes to make his home in your heart. And he begins to fill you just like Paul prayed, to fill you with hope and peace, to flush out of your system that anxiety and, and anger and frustration with others and to replace it with a divine peace from Christ himself. And if you've prayed that prayer in the past and you say, but today I just feel so filled with anxiety and with anger. Then in Paul's prayer is the answer to that anxiety and the answer to that anger. He says, may the God of peace fill you with hope and peace in believing. And so I want to call you to belief again and again and again, a belief in the person of Jesus in his ability to work all things for the good of those who love him and his ability to withhold and to protect his children. And if you've believed in him, you are his child. He is a sovereign and mighty God, and he can watch over you and protect you. That's why you don't need to be defending your own positions. You don't need to be advancing your own cause. You can be trusting in Jesus Christ, who loved you so much, he gave you many gifts. And most of all, he gave you himself. Let's pray. Father, where we have responded to people with frustration and anger, with a, with a short temper, with a criticalness, Lord, forgive us for that. Lord, forgive us for responding out of our flesh instead of responding out of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us, Lord, for producing the fruit of frustration rather than for allowing the Holy Spirit to produce in us the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that love and joy and peace and patience. Now, Father, may you give us a heart that believes in you, a mind that knows Jesus Christ. And as others have prayed, Lord, we say, where, where our faith is weak, make it strong. Where our belief is small, make it big. 
that we might enjoy the presence of Christ within us, that we may ha might have peace in our heart even while there's chaos all around. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Jesus is able to do, as the scripture says, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I mean, he's a mighty and a powerful God. And so the proper response to that, we've said this before, is to worship. And so as we get ready to sing this, this next song, I want to ask you to engage in worship. And what that means is to believe in the person of Jesus, to believe in his work, to believe in his love for you, well, to desire to walk with him. And so would you stand with me, those of you who are here, and, and for those who are watching online, I know it's hard to sing, but I want to ask you to sing. I want to ask you to sing because, because your trust and your hope is in Christ, and, and he deserves he deserves to receive your praise. He deserves to receive your, your affection. And so we give that affection in part by singing even if, even if we're not good singers. Because what God wants is the overflow of our heart, not, not some beautiful sound. And so out of the overflow of your heart, would you praise Christ with me?
Those are good words to sing. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. And when you think about all that God has done for us, how he sent his son, how he gives us grace, how he speaks to us gently, how he gives us grace upon grace upon grace, gift after gift after gift. And what else can we say? But great are you, Lord. And to say it from our heart because we mean it. I'll just say for myself, I know that it's very difficult to pursue Christ alone. And so we've been speaking earlier about life groups. And if you're interested in joining a life group, a group of people who would who would move towards Christ together, who would be peacemakers together, then I want to ask you if you would, you could sign up either online or through the, uh, through the church app. And we'd love to get you plugged into a group of people like you heard about earlier. I want to pray for you and ask God to bless you, this God of peace. And then as um, those of you who are here in the building as you prepare to leave, I want to ask if you could, if you could put your mask on and smile so big that people can see it in your eyes. That's how big I want to ask you to smile. So let's pray. Father God, God of peace, God of hope, God of comfort, fill us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with the truth that we find in the scriptures. And may you change our hearts that our speech towards you would be filled with love and affection and that our speech towards others would be gentle. In Jesus' name, amen. May God. All right, one, two, three.